name is Eden Yassi, I'm the Campaigns Officer for um, OUSA and um, I want to thank you all for coming today. So today we've got um, our political forum where we're going to hear from our MPs and candidates from different parties and um, I hope you'll all join in and listen and also have some questions ready for our open floor time. I will now um, call our awesome MC for the day, our very own Professor Mark Hennigan, if you could give him a round of applause. Thank you. I'll just briefly introduce our wonderful panellists. Um, Abe Gray, from Way Abe. Very famous on this campus. Um, Sam Pitt, also a, a, a former Knox student. Were you? Carrington. Oh, Lord, it would be a great place to go. Um, Shane Gallagher, Greens, down there. I shouldn't call it the party. Uh, Warren Boyd, who is with the uh, New Zealand First. Where is Warren? Thank you. David Clark, Labour, and Michael Woodhouse. So these are all people standing in this electorate, so it's very exciting to have them here and I think it's important that you engage in the debate and ask questions and uh, as many as you can because uh, you can't really vote if you don't understand what you're voting on. So let's, we'll start off first, I want each candidate in a, in a brief two to three minute clip to do the following, to first of all um, say who they are, um, uh, what they do in their, in their party and one fun fact about themselves, just something really interesting that's not political. That they may not be how to find something not political, but they can. So Abe, you're first off the off the rank. Hi. Hello. Turn it on. Hello. 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 My name is Abe Gray. Uh, some of you may know me. I've been around this campus for many years. And uh, this year, I am the Dunedin North candidate for the Opportunities Party. Uh, thank you. I've previously been a uh, lifelong activist for cannabis legalization. And um, now that the time has finally come that the rest of the world has caught up with what we've been saying for a decade, um, we can move on to other issues as well. And I'm really pleased that a new party has come along that looks at scientific evidence to create their policies and doesn't try to um, you know, posture or pose and try to think what will look the best or what will people like the best. And they really cut through to what works and that's what the Opportunities Party is all about. And this is evidenced by their willingness to adopt an evidence-based cannabis policy and that's why I went straight to them. But they have a lot of other great policies as well including a universal basic income that means that everybody is going to have um, a nominal amount of income so they can explore their dreams and fulfill their true potential. We also want to totally reform the tax system so that rich guys who have tons of assets pay more tax and workers who get income pay a lot less tax. And so we're going to bring in more tax but we're going to give all of you an income tax cut at the same time. And because we're taxing assets like extra houses, that is going to bring down the housing bubble and mean all of you can actually afford a home when you graduate in the future. So the Opportunities Party, we're not left, we're not right, we don't believe in tribal politics, we just look at the evidence and we focus on what works. And we can work with anyone who adopts our policies. And um, all of the other people in the party, we all know in New Zealand there's a lot of great people and everybody wants the same thing. We want it to be fair, we want the environment to be clean. We all just have a little different ideas of how we get there. But with the major parties, Labour and National, the, the thinking New Zealanders who uh, really want equality seem to be marginalized, but we know they're out there. Well, they've all come to the Opportunities Party, and when I've been involved in the Opportunities Party in the boardroom, you see a cross-section of all New Zealanders, and they're all very open-minded. They're not judging people like me. They're not saying stupid things, and uh, we are going to get over five. So give us your party vote. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, Thank you. Uh, Sam Purchase from the ACT Party. Sam. All right. Hello everyone, I'm Sam Purchase. I'm a second year student of microbiology and chemistry and I am the president of ACT on campus as well as the ACT candidate for Dunedin North. Now, statistically speaking, about 1% of you will have favourable opinions of ACT, so hopefully I will be able to change that and explain a bit about what it's about. So, we are socially liberal, we believe in freedom of the individual, freedom from the state, that you can live your life how you want to if you're not hurting other people. And we are also fiscally conservative, so we believe that the government should take a step back and more uh, independence and freedom-based uh, economic, economic should be occurring and look to private enterprise rather than state enterprise. 
So the, the issues that drew me the most to act, we've got David Seymour's euthanasia bill and, and uh, of the private members' ballot at the moment to uh, hopefully legalise euthanasia in New Zealand, increase bodily autonomy. We've got candidates who intend to liberalise abortion, which is still in the Crimes Act, as most of you know, and uh, if they get into the election. And we are, and housing as well was a major issue for me. I mean, the housing crisis in New Zealand is absolutely farcical, where our generation is more or less locked out of the possibility of buying a home. And there was a study that recently just came out from NZ Super U that said 60% of the price of a house in Auckland can be directly attributed to the Resource Management Act. And so we want to abolish that, get rid of the regulations on how you can use up the land, free up the land for over 600,000 new houses around Auckland, give you more rights over your own, uh, your own property and and enable that, uh, that infrastructure to be developed and hopefully just move forward and enable an innovative new, new industry like Uber, Harmony, Chariot, Lyft and basically look into the future and rely on people rather than relying on government. Thank you. Well done, Sam. Now we have uh, Shane Gallagher, who is the Greek Party. Shane. Kira Kudu, um, Shane Gallagher, I'm uh, a Greek Party candidate for Dineen South. And, um, so what do I do in real life? I, uh, I work here at the university in the ITS department and I'm on the university council. So I'm actually a council member on the, on the governing body of the university. And so you'll often see me in robes, myself and Mark, marching around doing our Harry Potter impressions um, during the, around uh, George Street. So one of the things I'm standing for the Greens is because um, we need to address climate change. Uh, we were the original and best. We, didn't suddenly discover climate change last weekend. We uh, we took it for a couple of decades now since the last century. So you know, original invest, climate change um, um, uh, champions. So we want to end poverty because uh, poverty is a huge issue for us. You know, uh, in this country, uh, there are two hundred over two hundred thousand children living in poverty, and that affects you for the whole rest of your life. That chases you and. Uh, makes your whole life really, really difficult. You have uh, diseases and all sorts of mental health issues. There's something else we'll be talking on, uh, about today. And the other thing is that we want to do is clean up rivers because um, the way, the direction we're going in now, we've seen our rivers and our lakes polluted. Uh, tourism is one of our biggest industries. It's now getting bigger than agriculture. And um, the dairy industry and tourism industries are now in direct clashes with each other. So we have to, find uh, a different way of doing agriculture, a uh, way that ensures that we have clean rivers. And the fun fact that I have from my previous life, which you guys didn't get about, uh, I used to actually own a modeling agency, and um, <laughs> I used to be a model agent, and uh, discovered Stella Maxwell, who was a psychology student here, and she is now a Victoria's Secret model, and one of the top models in the world, but she came from Otago, she was a Otago graduate, and she's in the psych department, so, um, that's a fun fact. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, I And now we have Lauren Boyd, who is from New Zealand First. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> this is my third general election, and I've stood for Dunedin Council on my other occasion. And um, I've had a political itch as long as I could scratch. So um, the reason that I'm standing is because you can either bitch about things or you can do something about it and uh, you've just got to find something that akins to what you believe. And uh, I believe in what New Zealand First stands for, which is common sense. Because in truth I haven't seen a lot of common sense um, from the major parties over the past 30 plus years since Roger Moronix came into view and um, they flushed the whole of New Zealand down the toilet systematically. They got rid of the things that <coughs> I grew up with that meant that we had a sound social structure and a reasonably stable economy. So now today, with the so-called improvements that have come about, particularly in the past nine years or so, <coughs> we've got some of the worst socioeconomic indicators in the world. There's nothing to be proud of, and quite frankly, I'm ashamed to get up in the morning, as you should be, to find that, well, there's nothing to laugh about, and what I'm talking about is homelessness. 
Why on earth we should have 40 odd thousand people homeless in a country of plenty is beyond me. What's worse is that there's been a government that's been in denial about it for the past nine years. And so I believe that New Zealand First has got the policies that are going to address issues such as homelessness and poverty, which are all the root of bigger problems coming down the track. And until we actually take stock of what's going on, stop, pause, and make decisions that are going to make a big difference, then nothing is really going to change. And the other thing to remember is that you don't ask the architects of the disaster to fix the problem. Because if they could have, don't you think they would have done it by now? So this election, I want you to go away and think about what New Zealand First represents and go to the uh, website New Zealand First and have a look at our policies. We've got 15 founding principles and we've got policies around repaying student debt to make sure that it's not a burden to them perennially with interest. And then, once you've thought about that, I'd like your party vote for this election for the Negan North. So thank you. Well done, Warren. Thank you. And uh, now we have uh, David Clark from Labour. Kia ora na mihi kia koutou. My name is Trevor Clark. I am the Labour candidate for Dunedin North and have been very proud to represent Dunedin North in this campus, uh, now in my second term in Parliament. Um, I'm a person who got into politics because I was concerned about the growing gap between rich and poor in New Zealand. That is the thing that motivates me. That's the reason I got into politics and it's because I wanted to make a difference in that respect. I am originally a Minister of Religion. That's what I trained as. Um, and in that role I saw people who were missing out on opportunities, people who weren't being supported with mental health and addiction issues and how it affected their life. I think that we can do better as a country to make sure that everybody has opportunities across the board. Um, I also worked at the Treasury for a period of time, please don't hold that against me. Um, but what I saw there uh, convinced me that also for the country it is smart not to have great big inequalities. Uh, because you do want to get the best out of everybody. If you've got a good public education system and good public health care, everybody can make their best contribution. And that's what I think we need to do as a country. So that's why uh, I got involved and stood for Parliament. Uh, I figured I could throw stones from the sidelines or I could get involved. And I guess the frustrating thing for me is that in the time I've been in Parliament, I've been in opposition and I've watched inequalities get bigger and bigger. So the OECD came out with a report and said that New Zealand's inequalities have been growing faster than in any other single country in the Western world for the past three decades. Faster than any other country. And they're on a track uh, that is going to see us eventually be the most unequal country in the Western world. And I don't think that's acceptable, and I think most New Zealanders would agree with me that everyone should have affordable access to quality health care, that everyone should be able to study if they want to, uh, regardless of the depth of their parents' wallets. Uh, and that we need to do things like clean up the environment and sort out climate change so that the next generation can also have a fair go. So those are the things that I stand for. Looking forward to the conversation today. And I want to say thank you to all of you who have taken the time to come out and uh, hear from the different parties. Some of these candidates are here for their first time. Please do listen. It can be pretty scary the first time you get up to do this. Um, some of us have done it a few times. Um, you can give us heaps if you want to. Um, but I want to take my hat off to those who are here for the first time and uh, also to you guys for getting out and informing yourselves. Fun fact, um, I, uh, well, I suppose I once uh, married Matilda Touray. Um, uh, I also married um, Grant Robertson and uh, I also married Trevor Mellor. Um, I'm also a funeral singer. Think of me. <laughs> It's now my privilege to introduce Michael Woodhouse from the National Party. Kia ora, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming along. I'd also like to acknowledge you. Uh, you are probably the converted, but I do also hope you're going to be something of John the Baptist's and spread the word. The one colour that's most prominent through the common room is orange. And, of course, that's the symbol of the Electoral Commission. 
Uh, there is a very, very concerningly low rate of enrolments in the Dunedin North electorate amongst people between the ages of 18 and 25. So I hope you'll help me ensure that people at least register to vote and then of course exercise that precious privilege that we have uh, to decide who will lead our country. Uh, I have been privileged to be a Member of Parliament since 2008, so I'm coming up to the end of my ninth year as a Member of Parliament. Uh, I am the Minister of Immigration, the Minister for Workplace Relations and Safety, and the Minister for ACC, as well as the Deputy Leader of the House. Uh, I'm born and raised here in Dunedin, and I have made it my life's mission, apart from making his life difficult, to representing both the Dunedin North and the Dunedin South uh, period, not, uh, uh, electorates not only for the 24,000 people who voted their party votes for national in those two electorates, but for every single one of the people that come through my office looking for help. Um, look, I'm really excited about this election. I think there's a real momentum building. Um, I'm going to take David up on his so-called facts about income inequality, but I'm very proud of the fact that I was part of a government that raised benefits in this country for the first time in 40 years. And at the height of the GFC, it is true, there were 225,000 children living in poverty as measured by the 50% uh, of the median wage that the OECD uses. Now, there are 135,000, and thanks to the Family Incomes Package that was part of Budget 2017 from the 1st of April next year, that will reduce by another 60,000. Not only did Labor not support that in the budget uh, by voting against it, they are vowed to repeal it if they become government. You know what, the thing that terrifies your parents the most is the fact that they will have to Skype you if they want to talk to you after they graduate. And that your future children are gonna grow up in another country. Do you know there are 150,000 people in this country that would have left five years ago that haven't? And they haven't because there are opportunities to stay, to grow, to develop their businesses and to earn good incomes here in New Zealand. And I want to make sure that is the case for you when you graduate and for your children. Fun fact, uh, as a graduate of the University of Otago in Commerce, I loved accounting, I hated the lectures. But I had some friends who we would sit here at lunchtime in the common room, and they were law students. So I thought, oh, I'll go along and have a chat, uh, have a listen and see what these law lectures are like. So I popped along to the Castle Lecture Theatres to listen to legal studies, uh, lectured to uh, by a young fellow by the name of Mark Hennigan. And 26 years later, Mark is still doing those 100 level papers, I think. I'm a one trick pony. To you. Well done. <laughs> to ask all the candidates a very important question for all students. We want to hear your policies on student fees and student loans. So each one, we'll start with you again, Abe. Has the Opportunity Party got a, a policy on student fees, how much they should pay or how little they should pay, and on how they should deal with their loans? They've all got considerable loans. So what is, what is the um, uh, Opportunities Party policy on that? Um, we don't have a specific policy to amend the fee or the loan regime as such. Uh, we don't want to take it away and we don't, we don't want to en enhance it in any way. But what we do plan to do is introduce a universal basic income. Now eventually we want that to cover everyone, but we're going to start off with three tranches of the most vulnerable. And one of those is people 18 to 23 years old. Now, the cost of education, um, there's arguments about it. I mean, it is heavily subsidized by the government, but on the other hand, it did used to be free. And I think a lot of people, when they end up with a high student debt, it's very frustrating because when you're really young, it's hard to figure out what you want to do. I mean, sometimes people have to do two or three degrees. Sometimes people do post-grad. So you can end up with a pretty heavy debt burden. Now, wouldn't it be great if there was a way to um, sort of spend some years after school figuring out what you wanted to do first before you have to go to university. There's a lot of societal pressure to go straight to university, and if you don't have an income and you can't get a job, a lot of people just come to get the loan living costs or to get the student allowance, but they still don't know what they want to do. Now, that's a pretty expensive way to figure out you know, what your real dream is. So with our youth UBI, everyone 18 to 23 will be paid the same as the student allowance, but they won't be required to study. They can do whatever they want, 
to figure out what it is that their passion is, and then they can you know, use that capacity they're building in those years to leverage that and really focus if it's they want to go to uni, if they want to start a small business, they can, they can have that financial cushion to figure it out instead of racking up debt while they're deciding what their calling is. Sam, this is Sam Fitch from the Act Party. I'm sure you're going to pay for all their fees, your party, Sam. Obviously. Uh, so so we, you know, we support this, uh, the status quo, basically. So, I mean, financially speaking, people with tertiary degrees are the most privileged group in society. On average, over the course of your lifetime, you'll earn an additional $2 million. So, basically, we, and we believe that the tuition fees that we pay at the moment and the loans that we take out is a reasonable price to pay. Having interest-free student loans costs the government $400 million a year, as it is, and... The, uh, and not to mention the amount of subsidy that is paid on your actual tuition fees. Essentially, there's, there's no such thing as free money, and to have the government pay for your tertiary education, as Labour would propose, it's, it's either you pay for the education you get through your student loans, or you pay for everyone's education over the course of your lifetime through taxes. It's just whether you actually pay for what you use, or whether you pay for everyone's. So we believe in paying for what you actually use, and the status quo as it is at the moment. Uh, no, we haven't got a policy to put interest back on student loans, even though most of us believe it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Dan. Um, Shane Gallagher, Shane Gallagher for the Greens. Now, what's your policy on student fees and loans? All right. Okay, so we're supporting. Uh, we're not going to put interest rates back on. We want to get rid of student fees, so we're supportive of uh, Labour's proposal on that. Uh, we want to. Um, we say the student allowances uh, for postgraduate students. We want to raise uh, the amount that uh, uh, your student allowance so it actually really reflects your costs. Because I know most of you spend most of your student uh, allowance on just rent, and you have very little left over for money, uh, money left over for food and stuff. Um, we want to increase uh, funding to the universities. Uh, one of the big struggles for us here as a university is that. Um, our arts funding has been frozen for a number of years now, and you've seen that uh, the direct consequence of that in the humanities um, uh, closures uh, recently this year. And uh, what's happening is now that uh, we want to make sure that it's free for the point of use, that you're supported all the way through um, your study here, and that if you want to do postgrad, that also is free, because. We're actually investing in you. Our modern economy cannot function without highly qualified, highly specialized, highly skilled people in this country. And so we're investing in the future. We're not trying to put debt on, on, on burdens on individuals because our society relies on our skills and our abilities and our innovative capacity. And that's why we don't think it should be a debt that we view uh, Ter tertiary education as a, an investment uh, for our country. Kira. All right, thank you. And now we have Warren Boyd from the Act Party. Sorry, oh Jesus Christ, sorry. No, no. You said I'm the first whistle, don't kill me. I don't need, I don't need a jacket for the Act Party. I'm sorry, Warren, I do apologise. I'm just going to read a few figures out, because figures always interest people, but I think it's important. All right, so at the moment the cost of the current system is $4,183 million, equivalent to 1.67 of GDP. And that comprises of student allowances of $496 million, crown subsidies of fees of $2,465 million, so student loan operating costs $719 million, other tertiary funding $503 million. So that in the, what we're proposing is to replace that with a total amount of spending of 4,638 million, well, it's actually not spending, it's investing. That's the equivalent to 1.86% of GDP, which is really just a drop in the bucket. So we're going to have a universal student allowance of 1,433 million, an upfront investment, I hear the word investment as opposed to subsidy, because uh, we feel that we are investing in the future of both the students and the country at large. So an upfront investment of 3,003 million, other tertiary funding of 222 million, and an international student levy of 20 million. So the difference um, in what's going to happen is that we're going to introduce 
a universal living allowance which is not subject to parental means testing as a priority for all full-time students. We're going to remove the deduction regime currently in place if a student earns over a certain dollar value per individual to an income gap yet to be established. And we're going to reverse the recent amendments to the Social Services Act which shut out full-time students from accessing accommodation supplement when they fit the appropriate criteria. And what we're going to do about the $15 billion of student debt that we have at the moment is we're going to have a dollar for dollar student repayment. And that means that for every year that a student remains after they've graduated in New Zealand uh, and pay off a dollar, we will match that for a dollar right now. So it's an investment in your interest to stay here. For individuals who spend five years working in identified central service areas and selected regions, there would be a complete debt write-off. Now those are a couple of the things. If you want this policy, see the gentleman over here with the hat on and we'll make sure we get you a copy. Thank you. Thank you, Warren. David Clark now from Labour. Hopefully that, yes. Um, look, Labour has always looked for ways to make education more affordable. Your secondary education may have been at a private school or an integrated school or a public school. If it wasn't for a Labour government, you wouldn't have had the choice of a public school. Labour made secondary education free because we believe everybody should have the opportunity, no matter how rich or poor, to have access to real educational opportunities. We have a plan to make tertiary education free as well. And it is achievable. It is uh, over time. The current plan, though, I have to say, will not help you guys much. Uh, because like me, you guys are in the position now where you're already engaged in tertiary education. I had to take out loans for my education. Uh, but it doesn't mean it isn't the right thing to do. A previous generation didn't have to pay for their tertiary education. And what we know is that when education is free, more people take up the opportunity, and the country as a whole is better off, both economically and socially, because there is a role uh, for those who are educated to be the critic and conscience of society. You guys being informed helps us be a better society. So we believe in free education. We want to get there. Um, it's quite possible we'll have more announcements on this as we get closer to the election, so do watch this space. Uh, but I'm not authorised uh, to break uh, more good news on that front right now. Cheers. Thank you, Dan. You guys work really hard, and I know the financial stresses can't be easy for you. Uh, but 82% of the total costs of your tertiary education are currently being paid for by the taxpayer. The people who cook your dinners at your university hostels the people who are making coffee in the link now, the bus drivers, the construction workers are all funding 82% of your studies. And there's definitely a public good to the education you get and the careers you will follow. Uh, Sam is right, I, uh, the, the numbers are a little bit different, but there's a significant income advantage because of the great choice you made to come here to Otago. And actually, I think that's fair enough. There are certainly no plans uh, to change that at all. A significant taxpayer investment is appropriate, but to make it completely free for you, with the benefit that you will get in future, and then, as Labour will have to do, raise the taxes on your higher incomes just to fund that, is not necessary or appropriate. So we uh, advocate the maintenance of the status quo. Thank you. Thank you. That's a really important question for students. Are there any questions from the floor? I've got other questions I want to ask our, our panel, but are there questions, student questions about loans, fees, allowances, those, those sorts of things? Anything you want further information or want to grill the candidates on? Yeah, can, can you grab the microphone to show me over here so we can hear them? There's another microphone there. So just jump up and speak. Hi. Um my question for you is, how much do you think is an appropriate amount for a student to try to live off while they're doing their studies? If we're going to pay it back anyway, how much do you think we should be able to loan to live week to week? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
you want to start? Start with it, answer that. Uh, well, the question presumes that the loan or allowance that you receive is the only income you would have. Uh, and for as many people as there are on this campus, there will be as many different personal circumstances that go into that. I work 20 hours a week while studying full time. I think that's probably far too much uh, for most, but I know a number of you will augment your income with part time jobs, working hard in the holidays and in the, um, in the Christmas break. Um, you may be supported by um, uh, friends or get other finance. You've also made the very sensible choice to study at Otago because not only is it the world's best tertiary education, it's also compared with Wellington and uh, Hamilton and Auckland, far lower living costs when you go flatting. So you've got a little bit of an advantage there, but the answer is it'll depend on individual circumstances. Any other candidates want to respond to that excellent question? Uh, what you, you, uh, David, then... then um um, I, I just want to say that I think the current amount is inadequate. I think it needs to be reviewed. Um, the living uh, loans and allowances have not kept pace with inflation over successive governments. Um, if you look in the early 90s at the level and then you look at the level of inflation, it's been outstripped. And when I was uh, in my previous role running Selwyn College, uh, this is just over five years ago, already then they were inadequate to pay for a full year's study on their own. You had to have more money than that saved from a summer job. And if you work full time over the summer, 40 hours a week on minimum wage at that stage, it still wasn't quite enough. So I think these things need to be reviewed, especially under this current setup. As I say, we, we will have more announcements to make. But as it stands currently, um, it's actually not adequate and it's not acceptable. Thank you. Thank you. And we, we take the same stance that the amount that we can get with the living costs is completely inadequate. But in Dunedin, we're lucky that we can scrape by for a cheap flat on the 175 a week. But if you're in Auckland or Wellington, then that won't even cover your rent, let alone your food and your leisure as well. So ACT has a policy to increase the living costs amount to an appropriate amount to actually live on, and then peg that to the rate of housing increases, which is, of course, the, the, the biggest issue is the gross housing crisis that we're in at the moment, which is just pushing rents far beyond what the living costs can, uh, can pay for. Thanks, Sam. Um, Shane, you want to say something here, yeah, and we'll come back to A. Um, no, it's, it's nowhere near enough. Uh, and we know this is a significant source of stress for uh, students, for, especially Maori and Pacific Island students who, have, um, who don't have uh, the kind of uh, background and financial support that other uh, p uh, communities have. Uh, for you know, if you come from a working class family and you may be the first person in your family going to university, the thought of that going into that kind of debt and having that financial burden on your putting that financial burden on your family is a real disincentive to go to university. And what, that needs to be removed. We need to lift those families out of poverty and the best way to do that is to allow students and you know young people coming through to have the advantages of an education. Right, thanks very much. Okay. Hey. Um, inflation is one thing, uh, but obviously the house price increase is the big thing that's making a difference. And as Sam said, depending on where you live, you're going to need more or less to live every week because of rent and the price of rent. But why peg your policy to the house price increase? Why not have a policy to stop the house price increase? That's what our policy is at the Opportunities Party, is to change the tax system so that excess land, excess houses, assets have a, a tax rate, a low tax rate, but one that's significant enough to create a market signal to deflate that housing bubble. So instead of just pegging you know, our policies to the ongoing increases of these costs flowing out, we have evidence-based structural solutions to get those prices down. Thanks, Matt. Warren, this is Warren White from New Zealand Food. Okay, so um, when you're at university, um, one of the things that we do on a regular basis is eat. Well, New Zealand First is going to remove GST off basic food, so that's going to help by 15% for the outgoings for a start. And um, in addition to that, we're going to raise the minimum wage to $20, so that when you are in the workforce, you'll be earning more for your trouble. And we're going to set up an entrepreneurial fund for 18 to 25 year olds to enable capable people such as yourselves to start up companies and thereby take advantage of the skills that you've got. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Thanks very much, Mark. Is there any other burning question on student allowances and, and loans? One over here? Yep, over here. Again. Hi, I just had a question for um, those parties that are looking at um, all free, or it's certainly a lot cheaper tertiary education. Um, how does that affect students in terms of more people coming to university and then the degree possibly not meaning as much because there's a lot more people with that degree? How, what would you be looking at to maybe stop that from happening, like um, increasing how hard it is to get into university or something, anything like that? Good question. The light's not on, but it's somebody's home, so that's good. Um, look, uh, the reality is we, we don't have a problem with more people getting qualifications. There are people with qualifications coming into the country every day uh, through our immigration system, and international evidence says that when you've got well-qualified people in a society, your economy is better overall, right? So it's actually a, a good thing. Um, and, yeah, that's probably to the point. Can I just make one other point while I've got the microphone? Um, we live in interesting times, and, um, and I'm very excited that we've got a new leader and we've got this uh, new surge of support. Um, it, and it's great to be up on stage, and, I, and I'm intrigued by lots of the answers that Abe's been given, um, which, which uh, ones that I, um, which surprised me a little. Uh, as someone who in the past has, has been very vehemently against the National Party, he's now signed up for a party that says it's happy to work with the National Party. And so can I just make the general point, if you support free education, um, that uh, there is only one party um, that is completely certain and completely driven to change the government, and that is the Labour Party. So if you really want to change the government and you really believe in free education, then uh, New Zealand First has said they'll work with anybody, the top party has said they'll work with anybody, you don't get a guarantee out of that that the government changes. So that's just food for thought. Uh, we're starting to hot up now. Things are warming up here now. Over to you, Abe. Uh, I'm glad that Labour sees the Opportunities Party as such a threat. I mean, we clearly will be getting over 5%, so your party vote will not be wasted on us. Thank you. And, um, you know, we're not left, we're not right, it's just what works. And so if, if, if Labour's going to take... Well, if, if Labour's going to take more of our policies, we'll go with them. If National's going to take more of our policies, we'll go with them. And as far as education goes, we already said, you know, we don't want to fill up the universities with a bunch of people that don't know what they want to do. We want to give them that freedom to follow their dreams and figure out what they really want to do. I think, Shane, you, your, your party also has a policy on, on, on is it free education or, or moving in that direction. Do you want to comment on the question asked? The question asked was, will this mean we'll have too many people come out with degrees which will develop a degree? Well, we already have um, academic uh, inflation. So back in the day, you could come out with a degree and go straight to a job. And now, you know, you need a master's degree to do that. So we're already seeing that in, in place. But because the, uh, there's more and more educated people uh, and society's become more complex, that's just what we have to do. We have to educate more and more. Primary school education used to be enough. Then it had to be secondary school education. Then it was a degree. Now it's almost postgraduate qualifications are absolutely necessary as well. So as society becomes more complex and more sophisticated, we more need more educated people. Um, that's just a good thing. And the more educated people we have, the better. And there are in fact two parties, David, if you remember, who are remember the MOU. Um, you might remember that. They they seem to forget to that name. Um, that are dedicated to uh, changing this government, we've committed to uh, that, and um, frankly, uh, you know, the Labour government, the Labour Party needs us in government with them to make sure that we have a change of government on the 24th of September, and um, we need to find about Green, because um, we have, again, been advocating for free education for a very, very long time. Thank you. Do you want to comment? you want to comment on that? No, you're fine. I think what we might do now, because it has been mentioned several times, there's a couple of other really big issues in this in this election, and, and because it's been mentioned, I, I think we might look now at the uh, the housing issue, because your generation, as people seem to be saying, will, may not be able to afford a house, and I, I think it's been mentioned by Abe and others. So, so perhaps we'll we'll, we'll, we'll start with uh, start with you, Sam. Uh, have you got any views on the uh, on the the fact that house pricing has increased quite a lot in recent times, and 
Is it an issue, or do you think it's just freedom for the individual to go with the flow? Oh no, absolutely. I think it's a colossal issue, and if you if you look at the statistics, it's one of the biggest causes of inequality in New Zealand at the moment. The actual gaps between the incomes have not drastically changed in quite a while, but what has changed is the prices that people have paid for housing. So, back before the RMA came about, the poorer people were paying 20% of their income on on housing. Nowadays, they're paying 50% of their income on housing, and that is that can be attributable almost directly to the Resource Management Act. It's been amended 19 times since it came out, and has not got any better. People are not able to build, people are not able to construct. Act wants to free up enough land for 600,000 new houses around Auckland. And the, as, as I said before, this, a study has just come out in the last month that shows that 60% of the price of a house in Auckland is due to land use regulations, 49% in well, sorry, 56% in Auckland, 49% in Wellington, slightly lower around the rest of the country. But we have different problems here other than land freeing up, but we have heritage buildings that you're unable to, to bulldoze basically and, and build new buildings but to because to, to renovate a heritage building is immensely expensive. We don't have any respect for people's property rights here. There was a chap down in South Dunedin recently who had a horrible corrugated iron tin shed on his property that he that was a heritage site because it was built ages ago, repeatedly vandalized, broken into. He bulldozed that, knocked it down. He was unable to use it because of the repeated targeting for crimes and he was fined ten thousand dollars for that. We need to respect people's property rights and enable the construction sector to move forward. It's fundamentally fundamental economic supply and demand. We have a huge amount of demand and no supply. We need to ease up the restrictions on supply, enable people to build, make housing affordable again, and that will solve or, or contribute greatly to solving inequality in New Zealand. Thanks, Dan. Housing supply. I am. It's a very important issue because housing supply and affordability is a significant issue for this country. Which is why we increase significantly income related rents uh, and accommodation supplements through Budget 2017, the Family Incomes Package, that the Labour Party not only vehemently opposed, they are campaigning on repealing it. That's a package that would put between $135 and $155 a week into the pockets of those struggling families in Auckland, Tauranga, Christchurch and Queenstown, and a little less in other places. The other thing we do is we're embarking on the biggest uh, housing build program in generations, and anybody who's been to Hobsonville or south and west Auckland right now, or Tauranga, will, and Christchurch for that matter, because for different reasons, uh, would, um, uh, would have seen the, the evidence of that. Christchurch was a natural disaster, and Auckland is a planning disaster. And we're having to fix both of those. But what happened in Christchurch, of course, was that because there were seven or 8,000 residential properties destroyed that had to be replaced, the price went up. Now, rents and house prices in that city are dropping. Why? Because more and more are being built, and that is the solution to that problem. Thanks, thanks, Michael. I think David may want to reply. Yeah, yeah, I want to write a reply because Michael keeps saying that we voted against the whole family incomes package. We did vote against the budget, and we were really clear about that. We we're actually the only party in Parliament that did, because we couldn't, in good conscience, then say we would do the things that we want to do in health and education. We're going to put an extra eight billion dollars into education and to help over the next four years more than the national government. We're going to put four billion more into education than what the national government's proposing to put down. And we've got a uh, fiscal plan that's been independently reviewed. Um, so it's actually a matter about priorities. But we have also done some changes uh, that have been announced around supporting families. So families will actually be better off, uh, most families will be better off under our package than what the government's announced. What they've announced is tax cuts in election year that would see me get $1,000 and the person that cleans my office get $20. I don't think that's a priority for New Zealand right now. I'm quite proud of the fact that we voted against that package and we said actually the priority is making sure that families have incomes with young children when it's most needed, when poverty is the hardest, to make sure we have the money also for educational opportunities and health opportunities. Yes, we did vote against the tax bribes in election year, but no, that doesn't mean that we left families in the lurch. We're also supporting them through our own package. Cheers. Warren, Warren Voigt from Zoom first, who wants to have a talk on the, on the housing. Okay, so about 15 years ago, we didn't have a housing crisis. And about 12 years ago, we had 
a national government that said crisis what crisis. And then for the next five years or so, they were still in denial. And then the homeless started appearing, and then the statistics started showing through, and then they ran out of excuses. And um, I'd like to tell you that uh, there's been a crisis for quite some time. And what New Zealand First wants to do about it is that we want all working uh, people in New Zealand to have an opportunity to buy their own home. You know, that's gone way out of sight. It really has. It's just gone to ridiculous levels where no one can op realistically, on top of having student loans, you can't realistically expect to be able to buy a house in New Zealand under the current climate. We believe that uh, it's achievable by direct government intervention, contrary to our act friend here who thinks that the market will fix it. Well, the market stuffed it up in the first place, so how the hell is the market going to fix it? It needs someone to, needs someone to take control of the chaos that's being let loose on this country called neoliberalism economics. The trickle-down bullshit that fails to deliver. They said... We'll have Roger, Roger Nomex and after three years everybody will do well. Well, it's 30 years later and what do we have? The worst statistics in the developed world. What a, what a track record that is. So we reckon there's enough uh, housing at the top end of incomes and serious shortage at the bottom end. And if it hadn't been for this government selling off state houses to their mates in the corporate field for speculation, we wouldn't have this crisis going on. If you don't, if you fail to plan, then you're planning to fail, and that's exactly what's going on. They've washed their hands of the issues for so long, and now come election year, oh, we can build houses. Well, Nick Smith tried to just get that started. How far have we got with that? Absolutely bloody well nowhere. So we're going to bring in a system of government assistance by a new state agency to acquire land under the 2013 Special Housing Accord Act to sell residential sections to first home buyers. There's going to be a 2% interest rate for at least five years to help gain land with normal bank finance to build dwellings which would be small on small sections and utilise New Zealand made prefabricated houses. Non-New Zealand citizens would be ineligible and terms and conditions for approvals by Overseas Investment Commission regarding ownership by non-residents fully monitored and enforced. That's to stop people coming in here and after five minutes being able to take great swaths of land from, from uh, Kiwi and uh, ownership. Low cost 2% finance funding to local authorities for elderly and public rental projects and tax incentives to encourage private investment for rental housing upgrading such as insulation and energy efficient heating systems and earthquake strengthening. And that's just some of our stuff. Thanks very much, Warren. Well done. A from the Opportunities Party. Uh, it's important to remember at this election, we don't just need a change of government, we need a change of policy. From the neoliberal economics that both Labour and National have given us, the entire 15 years that I've lived in New Zealand, the plan for economic growth from both the Labour government and the national government has been inflate the housing bubble. Land prices go up, the value of the economy goes up. Add in an occasional polluting industry here and there, and that is the plan. We need to reorganize this completely, and that's what the Opportunities Party tax policy does. So we are proposing a tax on assets. So all of those extra houses you own, you would pay 1.5% tax on that. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot, but for all of those land barons speculating, making huge capital gains out there, this is significant. In fact, it's so significant that it would allow us to drop the top income tax rate from 33% to 22%. So we are talking about a massive tax cut, $15,000 more a week for medical graduates, but we're making the rich people in this country pay their fair share. Now, the, the closest thing that anybody else has offered is a potential capital gains tax from labor, but they don't even know if they're going to do it or not, and they're not prepared to tell us until after the election. So what we're talking about is an entire reorganization based on evidence, based on 20 years of economic research that will work. Okay. And Shane, what's the Green Party policy on, uh, on housing? Uh, uh, so uh, let's talk about uh, rental rentals first. So we want to abolish letting fees. 
We want to have a mandatory WF on all housing, so all those cold damp flats that you're living in will be insulated and properly heated, and will have um, re there'll be really good conditions. So you're not having to be become sick because you're living in cold damp houses, which is a real issue you have here. And uh, we also want to build a lot of houses. We want to build 5,000 houses and give those to housing providers for social housing. We want to be able to, uh, students to be able to defer um, their uh, loan repayments so they can save up money to buy put a deposit on your house as well. And one of the things that we want to do is also look at trying to uh, uh, bond students so that as you for every year that you work here, that we will forgive you a year's worth of uh, student debt because one of the big barriers to uh, getting a mortgage, of course, is having a big student debt. So if uh, you're, for instance, you're a med student and you've racked up a lot of debt, uh, somebody who's going to be a doctor, then we'll forgive you a year's worth of debt uh, for every year that you work here. Um, and that's why we we'll keep our high quality uh, students contributing to New Zealand society. So we want to build a lot of houses. We want to make, have a rental, uh, a rental scheme, so a rent to buy scheme. So we'll, this government will build houses and have a rent to buy scheme. And if you move home from one house to another, you can pull that capsule with you. So those are a whole, some of the um, comprehensive policies we have, but uh, some of the most relevant for you guys. Thanks very much. I'm going to have a quick speedy right of reply, because what David Clark did was he justified the cancellation of a $2.1 billion family incomes package um, for our most vulnerable families on the basis that he would get a $1,000 tax cut. And then he went on and said, well, we're going to redirect that into um, parents of new children, uh, of young babies, because that's where it's needed the most. Except what he didn't say was that $3,000-odd that they would give to the parents of those new babies would be universal. He'd give it to me. Now, I'm on a pretty good salary as a cabinet minister. I don't need government support. Vulnerable families do. And that's where targeting has to be met. That's what that family incomes package that Labour opposed and would repeal is doing. What he doesn't also explain is where this $8 billion for health, the $4 billion for education, the X billion dollars for whatever tertiary bribe you're about to announce, and the billions of dollars of rail spending that they've already committed to Four weeks out from an election, the poor commenter in the Taxpayers' Union has Labour spending exceeding $30 billion. But remember what they said yesterday, no tax increases. They spend a week saying top income tax, capital gains tax, fuel tax, water tax. Well, but that was a bit unpopular. So now they've come up with some sort of economic alchemy which says we can do what we're doing now, spend $30 billion more, and you don't have to pay for it. Well, I can see that. It's going to work really well. Good luck supporting that. Well, just, just give, I'll give them, uh, just give, I don't think um, David Clark's had a chance to talk on the housing, and you may want to have a quick yeah, final and I, uh, I'll just briefly comment on that. Um, all our fiscal plan has been looked over thoroughly. Um, in fact, the Taxpayers' Union said that it was a, it was a perfectly fine one. Um, and they're, they're hardly a left-wing audience. Uh, they think it's a very clear picture of uh, spending and it's affordable within the current tax uh, system that we have. We're just choosing to do things differently. We're not promising a big tax cut. Now, for some people, uh, that won't be a good thing. If you're looking for a tax break to buy a second Maserati, you probably shouldn't vote for the Labour Party. Let's be honest. Um, but we do prioritise public health and education. And yes, unashamedly, we are supporting families with young children. New Zealand has an incredibly high rate of child poverty. We have amongst the lowest rates of child poverty in the OECD for the elderly and amongst the highest for children. It's not okay. Michael can give his as a donation to a charity, I'm okay with that. Um, but we will make it universal for the first year and in the second and third year it will be targeted. We've got to get over the child poverty in New Zealand. We have to do something about it. It affects life outcomes for people, for real people, and it also has a huge social cost. We have got to tackle child poverty, and we're doing that unashamedly, and we're not going to give tax cuts to the rich. That's the priority for us. On to housing. Uh, we've got a pretty comprehensive housing package, so I'll touch on a few things. We will ban non-resident foreign speculators from the housing market. In the TPP, if you've heard of that trade agreement, I used to be the trade spokesperson. Um, there's a whole bunch of countries, Singapore, Philippines, Vietnam, Australia, 
uh, amongst them who have reserved the right to ban foreign speculators from their housing market. But our Trade Minister at the time, Tim Grosser, uh, did not even ask for that in the TPP negotiations. That, that is because the current government believes in the free market solving everything, and they don't care that that is bidding up house prices. You can ask why that might be, and maybe it's got to do with the interests of their party. I don't know. But I think it's crazy. Our housing is unaffordable. For 25 to 40 year olds, one generation ago, 25 to 40 year olds half owned their own home. One generation on, that's down to a quarter. In one generation there has been a huge plummet in home ownership. I think everybody should be able to dream about owning their own home, who wants to, who can work hard and who is talented. That is unfortunately no longer the case in New Zealand. We've got a program called Kiwi Build that wants to build 100,000 homes over 10 years. Labor governments have built 10,000 homes a year uh, decades ago. It's been done before. We want to do it again because we believe we need more houses in this country. One thing I will agree with Sam on, we, we actually want to um, abolish those urban growth limits as well. We, we agree with the Act Party on that. Uh, National, again, seem content to see house prices continue to rise uh, at astronomical rates. And we think that that is shutting young people and a whole generation out of the housing market. It needs to change. Thanks, David. What, what, what I want to have a reply on this is one what from the New Zealand First Party. Okay. Um, I want to take Michael up on something here, and um, he was sort of going on about the billions that Labor was spending. Not as bad as the 85 billion that National have borrowed with interest from overseas iron banks, which, if New Zealand first get anything to do with it, they'll be changing our banking system over from Westpac to Kiwi Bank to make sure that uh, the money stays within New Zealand at least. Now, there's a surplus being broadcast yesterday that I think was about $3 billion or some rubbish number like that. And the reason the number is rubbish is simple. If you borrowed $85 billion and you turn around and say that at the end of each fiscal year, after spending, that you've got $3 billion over, yet you still owe someone out there $85 billion. to me that's a bit of a shortfall, isn't it? Now, when you turn around, um, Michael, and you talk about what Labour is and isn't going to promise, um, I think National have just put out that they're going to spend $10 billion on a roading system. Is that right? Over 15 years. It, that, that's right. It doesn't actually include the need, but don't worry about that. Okay. So, before the uh, 2015 by-election in Northland, um, Simon Bridges, which is an appropriate name considering that he promised to build 10 bridges up in the Northern region and they haven't even started yet, so the likelihood of getting $10 billion worth of infrastructure from the national government, or in fact from Labour for that matter, is a pretty remote prospect. They were only up in the if they won. That's right, they said only if they won. So. I think, I think we've had a, a good, good go on housing. I just want to come to one issue I want to run past all the panel and then we can open up for general. This is an issue which I think affects your generation much more than mine and it affects future generations, your grandchildren, and that's climate change. And I think your generation are, are, are deeply concerned and, and well educated on climate change. So I want every one of them to stand up and say, what is their party? New Zealand hasn't got a good record perhaps we could have on this. And I think it's across all the parties at the moment. So I'd be interested to see what each party thinks. Uh, about climate change. Hey, jumps and floor, he's sure. ready to go. Uh, well, we like to think of ourselves as even better than the Greens on environmental policy, so uh, yeah, thank you. Um, it's based on evidence, again, the Morgan Foundation has done 20 years of research on environmental policies. Of course, they're well known for their cap policies, which isn't top policy, but was a policy that's been adopted by every local council in New Zealand because it's evidence-based and it works. Uh, similar to our climate change policy, we want New Zealand at zero carbon emissions by 2050. We plan for polluter pay, so catchments will be monitored on a catchment by catchment basis, and all the inputs and outputs that are pollutants will be paid for by the people creating them, and people who are below those thresholds will get financial rewards and incentives. We also want to charge for water, so, you know, market mechanisms, when properly regulated, when not set up to, you know, give freebies to cronies and mates, but when actually uh, set there to provide economic incentives and disincentives to modify behavior, they can work, and this can work with our environmental policy. Okay.
Does the Ed Party have a, a strong climate change policy? Absolutely. Uh, we, uh, well, I, I'm a very strong environmentalist myself, being a student of science, and uh, frankly, I, I believe that private enterprise is the way to go forward with this. So we've, we've heard claims like predator-free 2050, but th this has been compared to building a hospital when the patient will be dead long before it's been built. It's, it's just not feasible, and our species are going ex extinct. We plan to sell land core, the government enterprise which owns over 170 farms, none of which have fences, many of which do not have fences, fencing the cows off from the waterways or anything, so it's highly polluting. And we plan to use that money to fund a sanctuaries trust which will, which will pay for privately run sanctuaries up and down the country, enabling birdsong, and it's akin to Zelandia in Wellington if you know it, and allowing birdsong to be heard up and down the country and basically environmentalism by conservation. And in addition to that, the rivers which are being uh, flooded with nitrates, we plan to turn water into a tradable resource. So instead of taxing it as labour would, we plan to continue the quota system, but then if you, if you use less than that, you're allowed to sell the excess, which incentivizes people to maintain the water quality because of the financial incentive. And we support carbon tax. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Warren, do you want to, to talk about the Ed Party? Then we'll come, keep coming down. Oh, I don't want to talk about the <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might want to comment on what Sam said, but you don't. Not right. That's why I said, talk about Dylan first policy. <laughs> I know you're versatile. <laughs> So, um, I won't say that I'm the biggest environmentalist in the world, although I don't believe that we should be filling the oceans with plastic, and nor do I believe in deforestation. And, uh, but one of the other interesting things is, I don't particularly think that, and neither does the party think that um, spending $1.5 billion a year on a ca carbon tax going into some Wall Street slush fund is a particularly effective way of dealing with the issues here. What we need to do is develop policies that deal with what we're doing here, not try to solve somebody else's issues by sending money, more money offshore. So if you want to have a look at the New Zealand First website, you might be able to get a bit more detail on our, uh, any of our climate change policies as such. Um, one thing I would point out, though, is that one thing we are very much against, and you're going to think, well, what's, where's this coming from? But I mean... What I'm trying to say is that the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, which is being tacitly agreed to by Labour... No, you said you're opposed to certain... It provided certain aspects are covered. You haven't, you haven't categorically said... You have not categorically... Because after all, it was, Labour, it was Labour that started it in the first place. OK? And that's all I wanted to know. So. What I'm trying to say about this is that when we have a, a, an agreement from overseas countries that favours foreign corporate multinationals to allow them to come in and set the laws and regulations in a country like New Zealand, that takes away our right to look after our environment. Now, I want you to think about that before you vote for either two of these people, or at least test them on it next time you talk to any of them, to find out about things like the... ISD is the Internal, uh, International Settlements and Disputes, all right? Because those are, the, those are the tribunals that are going to matter when it comes to the government being able to proactively protect the working rights and conditions and the environment going forward if any agreement like this is signed up to. So I'd be very wary about any party that even remotely looks like is going to sign up to the Trans-Pacific Partnership in any modified form, I would just ask them about that very, very carefully, because otherwise the environment won't matter at all. There are already Chinese dairy farms, factory farms, being set up in the North Island that have no consideration whatsoever for the environment. All right? So that's just one example. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Warren. Shane, do you want to comment on the, the Green Party's climate change policy? Uh, the original and best. Uh, we've been campaigning this since the last century. Uh, we want to be uh, carbon neutral by 2050. We want to take the billions of dollars that National wants to spend on foreign uh, carbon tax credits and invest it in New Zealand to create innovative jobs uh, and transform our economy and lead the world like New Zealand has done before in showing the pathway forwards. We can become carbon neutral. We can innovate and uh, 
be the technological and intellectual leaders going into the future and ensure that we all have a, uh, a future that's free from the ravages of climate change. We want to invest heavily in our technology, in our efficiency, and in our people, and uh, clean up our environment. And the only way we can do that is with vision and with investing in, in ourselves and having strong, clear targets that we can all uh, drive towards and we can lead the world in becoming carbon neutral and uh, show the world how it's done. Sure. Thanks very much, Shane. Yeah, but, uh, who wants to go first, Dave? Toss a coin. Dave's going to go first. Then he gets a pot shot at me after. Um, look, climate change is this generation's nuclear free moment. Um, Jacinda Ardern has, as our leader, been really clear that we need to tackle climate change in a serious way. I agree with Shane, we need to lead again. Uh, I personally worked on climate change policy in the last Labour government. I was at Treasury working on climate change policy and then worked in the Minister's office when we put through the emissions trading scheme. Uh, I was, uh, I mean, I understand the carbon tax didn't get through because it couldn't get the support in Parliament, but Labour kept going. And Labour led the world. Uh, I went with the Minister to the UNFCCC climate change talks in Bali and I had to make speeches for the Minister, even though I was a mere public servant, because there was so much demand to hear what New Zealand had to say on climate change. We introduced, in New Zealand, the first all-sectors, all-gases emissions trading scheme in the world. We led the world. And then National got in shortly afterwards, they repealed uh, that well, they took the cap off a cap and trade scheme, and anyone who's studied economics will understand that that makes it not a cap and trade scheme. Uh, and then, basically, that meant agriculture had no uh, no burden on them whatsoever, even though they're half of New Zealand's emissions. Um, they removed the uh, matters that sat alongside it: the um, biofuel sales obligation, um, the ban on new fossil fuel stationary um, electricity generation. Uh, and so on. So they had a clear agenda to unwind what was happening in the climate change space and they did it immediately, they got in government. And we've seen no progress since. They've signed up to the Paris Accord and then made absolutely no change to the policies. They are to carry on doing what we're doing now, which is not leading the world. They say well, we want to be fast followers, we're not even seeing action on that front. New Zealand is a small country with huge natural resources. We are close to the water and water-based generation um, is coming on stream slowly, if you excuse all the bad puns. We have our capital city, and it is incredibly windy there. We have wind farms next to it. We should be supplying technology to the world in the climate change space. This is what New Zealand is good at. We can lead the world, and we must lead the world. Labour wants to put in place an independent climate change commission, which sets carbon budgets for the country. So we've actually got an independent body that no matter who's in government, overlooks what's going on and says, are we on track to get our carbon emissions down? Rather than having governments claim, we're doing this, we're doing that, we actually need some independent oversight so that we can actually see as a country we are making progress and that we are doing our bit. To say we're too small to do anything is ridiculous. It's like saying to a child on a sinking boat that they shouldn't get a bucket to bail the water out. You're too small. Everybody has a part to play. New Zealand has an important role to play, and actually there's an opportunity, if we lead, to share our technology for the work with the world uh, and to make a huge contribution and actually to do well out of it. Thanks. So not only are we extremely keen, uh, like the other parties, to make sure that we do uh, become carbon neutral as soon as is practicable. I'm very proud of the track record that we have achieved over the past nine years. Let me give you a couple of thoughts. Firstly, Labor's emissions trading scheme is held up, because it was their creation, it is held up as one of the world's finest uh, trading schemes, but it wasn't all sectors, all emissions. That was a statement of aspiration. Labor then kept a massive part of our economy out of the scheme for a time including T.Y. Point Aluminium Smelter with significant concessions, Marsden, um, the, the steel plant, all heavily carbon emitting and out of the scheme when it first came in. Now farming is, and primary industries generally, are a significant challenge. Why? Because they make up about 48% of 
New Zealand's total emissions profile. Now that is very, very high when compared with the rest of the world, largely because um, so much of our electricity is uh, by renewables. It's approaching 80% now. And while we did uh, remove the ban on stationary energy power plants, none of them have been created. And indeed, the proportion of our renewables has gone up. But the problem with um, agriculture is that we could arbitrarily cut the number of, say, dairy farms in New Zealand, and that would lead to higher global emissions. Because we, have one of the, we, we are the most efficient producer of protein in the world. And there is a massive demand for protein. So why on earth would we arbitrarily cut that so that poor producing countries can fill that gap and make uh, global greenhouse gas emissions worse, not better? One of the best things to come out of a very disappointing Copenhagen um, summit was the Global Agricultural Alliance, a combined investment over half a billion US dollars into reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, on farm. And New Zealand is widely credited with leading that. So yes, we are fast followers in some areas, but we are uh, significant leaders in that area that we know most about, agricultural science. And if we can make um, even a small change to that emissions profile, um, nationally that would help, but internationally it would have a massive, massive positive effect. And the last thing I would say is around um, technology transfer. I think we're on a very, uh, we're close to a technological tipping point with things like um, uh, electric vehicles, trucks, even ships can now run on uh, LPG. But there's no point converting to electricity if those countries that do so produce their electricity by coal. And so we can, um, I think, make a massive change in a move from stationary energy to electrical energy over the next 10 years, and I'm looking forward to seeing that happen. Thanks very much, Michael. I think what we'll do now, we'll open the floor up so you can ask any question to an individual or to the panel generally. You've got the microphone there, Eden. So um, we've got one here, and then we've got one over here. Um, I've got a here. question for the New Zealand First candidate. Um, so I notice on your website, um, there's discussion of a state housing program and the uh, mechanism which I garnered from that was that broadly the state was going to acquire land for the purpose of uh, development by the state to effectively increase the supply of housing available for um, people seeking housing, is that correct? My question is where you're going to get the land from? Well, given that we're not in a position to start looking at it yet, that's got to be determined. But given that other parties have said that they'll be able to do that, I don't see that it's impossible. It's purely a matter of looking at the situation and then developing the plan from there. Um, there we still have state housing in stock. A lot of that could be redeveloped as well, but through the government, not through speculation. Does that answer your question? Thanks very much. There's one just right here, right in the middle. Yeah, this is for everybody. So every, every, everybody. Everybody. Uh, primary industries, particularly dairy, are arguably our biggest polluters and affect climate change the most. How does each party plan on reconciling the motivations to be environmentally conscious and reducing climate change with our current heavy reliance on primary dairy industries? You guys got into this a bit before, but I was wondering if you could elaborate any more. Uh, so one of the things we want to do, we want to shift, uh, we want to juice the dairy herd by about half. Uh, we want to convert to or organic or semi-organic farming because that's where we actually get the most profit. So by reducing your herd size and reducing your impacts, you can actually increase the profits because you don't have so many uh, inputs into your herd. And that's, and this, that's science and that's mathematics, you know, it's very, very straightforward. We can switch to low impact, highly sustainable agriculture, and that's how we're going to do it. Thank you. Hi. Uh, as, as I said before, we want to charge for water and we want to monitor the pollutants on a catchment by catchment basis so that when it's coming from your farm and going into the water, you pay for it. And if you're below the allowable target, then you get a reward for being below that target. So that creates an economic incentive. It's not going to be profitable to do dairy if you have to pay for the pollution you're creating. You're going to have to clean your farm up if you want to keep farming. Warren, does the gentleman first want to make a comment on that? He's fine, right? Well, it's not what we're going to do, it's what we are doing. We've already required 26,000 kilometers of fencing uh, of farming to keep 
uh, mainly dairy cattle because they're the they're the ones that um, um, have uh, the most discharges into streams. Riparian planting, science is going to fix this, right? So nitrate release. Uh, we've, we've overused fertilisers for years in this country, uh, and we need to reduce that significantly. There's plenty of ways to do that, and I think um, the one thing I will agree with Shane because I don't believe we need to halve our dairy herd. Um, that would be not only um, uh, economic suicide for the country, it would actually result in greenhouse gases going up, not down. Um, but we can certainly reduce the amount of nitrate used. Well, because the protein is produced by countries, because the demand doesn't go anywhere, the protein is produced by countries that are very poor uh, in their environmental record. So we can... Um, oh, it's science. Methane reduction science is a really, really important part of what we're doing now. Um, and I think um, that is part of that Global Agricultural Alliance. It's very much the focus of what's going on in that uh, program. Thank you. Dave, do you want to comment? Yep. Um, just in terms of environmental stuff more broadly, we've said we want to introduce a water levy. Uh, now, it won't cost $18 a cabbage, no matter how often the National Party say it. Um, we want um, Treasury to make recommendations on the levy so that it allows businesses to continue but rewards those who use sustainable practice um, and we want more sustainable practice. We also will make um, increasing herd size uh, something that has to require um, permission. Not that currently, if you increase the herd size in dairy, um, it is uh, just you can just do it. And so we we have seen the dairy herd grow and grow and grow. Um, we would then expect people to show how they're going to make their practice more sustainable. If they want to increase the herd size, they have to demonstrate sustainability with it because we think we have a real issue that we need to address. We do uh, also rely heavily on tourism, and that relies on a clean, green image, and actually tourism is now our number one earner. Um, we need to be doing a whole lot better than we're doing now. There are plenty of farmers who are doing a good job too. Let's not forget them, because there are some real leaders out there, and lots of farmers are putting sustainable practice in place. We just need to make sure that the laggards uh, are encouraged to catch up. Thank you. Uh, Sam and Warren, do you want to make any comment on this at all? You'll be happy. This is Warren Voigt from first. I guess what it all comes down to is um, making sure that uh, people have enough incentive to, uh, when they're producing things, make sure that they're looking after the environment. And one of the things that has always been attractive about New Zealand is that we have that clean green image. So without knowing our policy backwards on this one, because as I said, it's not a it's not a strong suit of mine. Um, I would imagine that um, one of the things that a government could do, and New Zealand First as a party could do, is to make sure that there are incentives for um, companies to ensure that um, anything that they're producing is as environmentally friendly as possible. Um, other than that, I don't think I can add anything to that, so I'll just pass it over to Sam. Sam, you want to make a comment? Exposition is uh, very similar to nationals on that. We believe that innovation in science is the way forward and that property rights will ensure that people take a bit more responsibility for the pollution that they're creating. And when the water becomes a tradable resource, then the nitrate leaching will hopefully they'll be de-incentivised to put as much of that into the rivers and waterways. Uh, and, and me personally, part of the reason why I got into studying microbiology is that I'm, I'm particularly interested in finding sort of new solutions to that and finding a way for, to ensure green and uh, environmentally friendly agriculture. Thank you, Sam. So we've got a question down the back, Ed. Phone on, I think. Yeah. Okay, so my question is for all the parties, and it's about mental health in this country. I think our youth suicide rates are atrocious, and I also think the mental health statistics, both in and outside prison, need to be looked at, and the services need to be increased. What, like, what do the different parties think the, like, pressing or like initiatives that they'll bring to the fore to actually solve these problems once because these suicide rates have been high for decades. Thank you for such an excellent question, well done. So, who's going to start, Shane? Your choice. So, um, so, obviously we want to re, you know, get mental health funding back up to where it should be. Uh, we have, we're facing a mental health crisis with the young people. Um, the causes for that are myriad. Uh, it's to do with poverty, it's to do with uh, a sense of hopelessness, a lack of control over your life, it's to do with uh, this, you know, being tested all the way through school, you know, national standards, but huge amounts of stresses on children, not having enough support mechanisms in for children learning disabilities. Um, 
My son is 17 years old. So many of his friends, and himself included, have had mental health issues. It just terrifies me. And it's because of the pressure that kids are coming through uh, with every aspect of your life. And it's a sense of not being in control and not knowing what the future is going to be like. So we have a huge number of issues that we need to, th that come to bear on mental health. And we have to have a huge set of um, different uh, approaches to ensuring that you can actually have good mental health. So it's just not just the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, which is counsellors and, and mental health workers, but ensuring that you feel secure in school, that you're not being bullied, that you have a safe environment, that you can, you know, you can wander around your neighbourhoods without, uh, without fear and you can go adventuring. So you, there's all sorts of things that contribute to poor mental health. And it's a whole society approach that we need to take and we really need to have a good look at ourselves why is society suffering so much mental illness? And it's something that we as a, uh, a society need to have a real deep and long and hard conversation with ourselves about. Thank you, Shane. Um, a Gray from the Opportunities Party. Um, so for the Opportunities Party, our increased tax take on land speculators and asset stashers is going to allow us to devote $450 million towards mental health funding. Uh, we have a comprehensive health policy that's focusing on prevention and wellness that has yet to be released, but as part of that, there will be $450 million available for mental health funding. Additionally, the youth UBI that I've spoken about a bit already, hopefully will take some of that financial edge off and reduce the financial stretches, which unfortunately in some extreme situations have pushed people over the edge. Thank you, Eric. Warren, do you want to make a comment for the New Zealand First? Warren Voigt. All right. Um, there's a big um, there's a big problem with mental health in this country, and as Shane quite rightly alluded to, it's really been created by a hands-off approach um, to people. In other words, starting to treat people more like economic units of production rather than real living human beings. Um, that's obviously not working. You know, we've got a social disconnection going on, we've got levels of hopelessness uh, and homelessness and poverty and all those sort of malaise that ultimately end up um, t having people turning to uh, addiction to substances and alcohol and, and all those other things that are really not doing us any favour. Um, and so the main thing is, is to make sure that you identify those things at source. Years ago, there used to be a thing called a Plunkett service, and what that meant was that, uh, in fact, I live over the road from a hall, that um, every morning when I get up and open the blinds, uh, I see the words above a room on one corner of it, Plunkett rooms. And that was where the local neighbourhood had um, a room set aside where, on a pre-appointed time, the mothers, the local mothers could go and express their concerns and what have you with their children to, to the nurse. Or alternatively, the nurse could go and visit them. Um, what we've had over successive years, right back into, uh, I think it was back as far as the time as the Longley long Labour government, was that they started degrading that Plunkett service. And the reason I'm talking about this is quite important, because, you see, it's the fence at the top of the cliff. And, and what I mean by that is, so, at the moment, we've got a pocket service which is a hotline, all right? So, you know, if mother's got a problem, if she knows about it, she'll ring up the, the pocket hotline. But the hotline isn't on the spot. It's not going into the houses and assessing uh, what the conditions are like in there and identifying those things. For mothers under stress, mothers going through postnatal depression, and all those kind of things, you know, might be relationship problems, there could be a whole heating, there could be lack of food, a whole range of situations. When you start identifying those, then help can be given to get people to the necessary support services. Not just sending them down to winds to hope for the, if they can get in, gets some more money to throw at the problem, because you've got to have the skills to be able to do that in the first place. And so, you know, we, we actually believe in putting those support services back in place and on top of a range of other uh, community support services 
uh, New Zealand First will put things in place for the health service that will, if you like, prevent a lot of the stuff coming on that's um, creating uh, a lot of the mental health um, issues that we've got going today. Thanks, Warren. Sam, Act part. Um, mental health is, uh, is hugely important to us and we believe that the current system is more or less a failure. We've got some of the worst youth suicide rates in the OECD and we, we've been steadily increasing funding since National got it and National were the ones who increased the funding but our rates have not been steadily improving along with that. So we want to completely shake up the system and do similar things to the, to the successes we've seen with our partnership schools which have had incredible results for people who have been completely let down by the public school system. We want to do a, have, take a similar approach to the mental health system by investing in private initiatives, give them targets to meet, continue to fund those that succeed and don't continue to fund those that do not, and actually revolutionise, allow new approaches to be taken with mental health and hopefully see some positive outcomes from that. Thank you, Sam. And Michael Woodhouse yeah, from the National Party. That last point's a really good one, I think, because uh, while we have been increasing mental health funding significantly over the last nine years, albeit that we'll never win the contest of who can spend the most uh, between National and Labour. Um, and we've also appropriated another $100 million this year for, for the sort of specific projects that Sam is talking about, which is trying new things, including new technologies. And I hope David talks about the bags that he's wearing uh, on his uh, jacket, because um, there is a number of uh, uh, management strategies now that, are, that we're learning about from around the world. But I think we also need to do two other things. One is um, have a much deeper dive into the causes of mental illness in this country because if it was as simple as money uh, or financial poverty, I think we could solve that really quickly, but I think there are other things at play, particularly drug and alcohol use that is leading to a cycle of depression and anxiety that many people can't break out of. Um, but also I think 30 years after the deinstitutionalizing of our mental facilities, mental health facilities like Cherry Farm and Seacliff, we remain very vested in bricks and mortar and in institutional care, and I think we need to look very seriously at a, um, a more preventive model and a more community-based model than our DH DHP system currently has. That's a personal view, not a government view, but I think there's plenty of work that we need to do to make sure that the investment that we do make is actually put into the right place. Thank you, Michael. And finally, David Clark, Blake. Well, mental health issues are huge for us as a society. I'm our health spokesperson, and also previously when Annette King was our house spokesperson, I was our mental health spokesperson. So these are issues I care deeply about uh, and I think we need some significant change uh, in the area of mental health. Everywhere I go in the country, almost everybody I meet knows someone in their immediate family or in their circle of friends who has had a mental health issue. It's one in five New Zealanders. So everybody has a personal connection to mental health and many of them unfortunately have difficult stories to tell of interaction with the mental health system. It is not achieving what we would want it to achieve. I think the statistic of worst you, uh, teen suicide rates in the Western world speaks to that pretty plainly. Um, we have said that we want to um, do some pretty sensible things. The first of those, well, let me take a step back. The People's Mental Health Review came to Parliament 500 people told their personal stories of interactions with uh, the mental health system. And I think that that was a pretty um, impressive document. If you haven't had a look at it, do take the chance. Uh, an open letter was signed by 12,500 people saying we support this review and its simple recommendations. And the recommendations were as follows. First, do a review of the system. Work out what's working, what's not working. Second, Put some funding into the system so that you actually fund the things that are working. Third, have a bit more education. Um, the education campaigns that have been in place have dried up. And fourth and finally, have independent oversight of the mental health sector so you can actually hold governments to account on whether they're doing a good job or not. The Minister of Health responded to that report by saying the people who presented it were left-wing anti-government activists. He did not take that report seriously. And I think uh, some of his colleagues have stepped away from that. I'm sure Michael would probably be a little bit uncomfortable with that description. I, show, I think, though, it shows how out of touch this government has become on mental health issues. So we want to firstly do that review, make sure the funding goes to the right place, have some more education, uh, and have independent oversight so that all governments are held to account on how they're achieving 
in mental health. We've also announced some specific initiatives because this is a huge priority for Labour. We've said we want to have a nurse in every secondary school in the country with some mental health training. Uh, the formula is uh, five nurse hours per 100 students per week. So for most secondary schools that will mean a full-time nurse who's available uh, should mental health be an issue for individuals. They'll also give nutritional advice and so on. We've also said we want to run out a pilot which will start with the 400,000 people in the most vulnerable communities in New Zealand that will give a free GP visit for anyone that presents with a mental health issue and then a referral within the same practice to a mental health coordinator who has time and resource and skills to speak with the person. Because if you go to a GP, you get 15 minutes, and chances are, if you've got a mental health issue, it's taken more than 15 minutes to develop, and it's not going to unwind in 15 minutes. You actually need someone who has some more time. Do we want to put that in place? Um, and we expect to roll that out once we've learned the lessons from it. Now, the Nurse and Schools program has been proven in DSL 1 and 2 schools. And some schools work better than others. We've uh, looked at the Auckland University research and we want to take what worked and roll it out to all of the schools because mental health is not just uh, a DSL 1 and 2 problem, it's across our, our school system. Likewise with the GP uh, clinics, we'll start with the most vulnerable but we're looking to roll that out further uh, once we've learned what the program uh, has in it. So those are two very specific things. Um, that we want to do immediately, but we'll look at that review as well. And it doesn't need to be a long review. We actually just need to look out there to the community groups and see what's happening. In Otago here, in the past year, all of the mental health community providers, after six years of flatline funding, have been told they had to take a cut this year of 5%. So while their costs have been going up for the last six years, they've had no new funding, and this year they've been told they're taking a cut. That is what's happening with health in our country. The current government, we had an infometrics look at the Treasury data with an ageing population with more complex needs and more young people coming into the system and said, what amount of money would need to have been put in since 2009 to deliver the same level of services in the health system? So for old people getting cataract surgery, hip surgery, for young people and across the population, access to mental health services. And the figure that Infometrics came back with when they looked at the Treasury data, a growing population and with more complex needs, they said the government would need to have put 2.3 billion more in since 2009. That hasn't happened, and so services are being cut. It is no longer the case that if your GP refuses you for mental health services and says this person is suicidal, that you will automatically be accepted in those mental health services. People are being turned away who have been described by their GP as suicidal. The system is broken and needs to be fixed. That's what I want to do now. I'm just going to wind up. I'm going to give each, I'm starting from the beginning, each candidate one minute, because we've got classes. I've got to give each, you can come to my legal system next, you might do one shortly. Um, one minute to say why we should vote for their party. Just give us one big idea, and we'll start with you, Abe. Why should we vote for the Opportunities Party? Hey, great. Just one minute, bang, on. Okay, well, I guess the easiest way to look through this would be uh, the lens of the disconnect between our country's tourism marketing and the reality. We all know really cool young people that have come here from overseas because they have this idea of New Zealand, but it doesn't match the reality. But we all want it to match that reality. We all want New Zealand to be cleaner. We want it to be more fair. But there's big elephants in the room like cannabis, like the housing bubble, that these parties haven't got the guts to address. So all I can say is beware of celebrity personality politics. It's not a beauty contest, it's not a horse race. This is all of our futures that's at stake here. So vote for the party that has the policies that you most agree with. So go and have a look at our policies because we've spent a lot of time working on them, not on our uh, posing or our graphics. Have a look at our policies and you decide what you think is best. Well done, thank you. Thank you, Act. <laughs> Sam, Sam Pinchers, Act Party. I'd say that a vote for Act is a vote for the libertarian principle of freedom from big government, of being allowed to do what you want with your body if you're not hurting other people. It comes down to the old maxim, my choice is what I choose to do if I'm causing no harm, don't let it bother you. Your choice is who you choose to be. If you're causing no harm, then you're all right by me. And that is more or less the act principle. So party vote act if you want to be able to buy a house, you want to be able to do what you want with your body, and you want, be, want to be able to utilize new businesses like Uber and Harmony and Lyft and Chariot and see 
us looking to the future for transport options rather than looking to the past as Labour is proposing. Thank you, Sam. Shane Gallagher, Green. So, if you want to change the government uh, on the 23rd of September, if you want clean rivers that you can swim in, if you want to end poverty in this country, and if you want to have real climate action where we actually lead uh, the world into a clim uh, carbon neutral future, party vote green. Thank you very much. Warren Voigt, New Zealand First. Okay, here are five reasons to vote for New Zealand First on September 23rd. Because our goals for all who want, our, our goals are for all who want an affordable safe house, access to first world health care, open education escalators for our young to go as far as they can, first world jobs and first world wages and salaries. Secondly, because mass immigration should not be a substitute for failing to educate, upskill, train and employ our own people first. Number three, because our country's assets, ownership and destiny must be in our control, not that of other countries. Four, because our economy should work to uplift and sustain our people whilst restoring our leadership, economic and social uh, levels in, into the first world, where we used to actually be. We've slipped a whole lot since then. Number five, because safety and security of our people and property is the first of freedoms, so we'll recruit an extra 1,800 extra frontline police. Red and blue, nothing new, the choice is black and white. Please give your party vote to New Zealand first. Thank you, Warren. Thank you very much. David Park, Labour. Okay, um, Labour believes in opportunity for everybody. We are a party that has always stood for the many rather than the few. We're true to our principles. We want free education. We want affordable access to quality health care for everyone. And we are a party that is hoping to change the government. If you want to change the government, the best and most important vote you can give is your party vote to the Labour Party. We, unappetising though it may it seem, it may come down to negotiation. The bigger the Labour Party's mandate, the bigger our chance to lead that negotiation, to form a new government, to create a better New Zealand. Thanks. Thank you, David. And then Michael Woodhouse, National. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your interest in this election. Please vote. Please implore all of your college mates and your workmates to vote. This is going to be really important. I think this country is on the cusp of something really, really good. We have come out of the GFC, the Canterbury earthquakes. We're returning to surplus. We're investing in families. We're investing in those vulnerable members of our society. And I think we're on a really, really good path. If, I really actually think that the, the excitement that's been built over the last few weeks because the left are eating each other's lunch, uh, thinking out loud about resigning, then resigning, then refusing to resign, and then resigning because two people thought you should resign and they resigned because you didn't. If you think that's really fun, that's great. That's, that brought your attention to this. But if you really think those sorts of parties are better at leading this country right now than a strong, stable, national-led government, I think we need to just think again. I would love two texts from you, but if you can only give me one, please give your party vote to the National Party. Thanks very much. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> well, just before we um, finish, can we all give a, a, a large applause, because we've been here for nearly two hours, and I think they've all answered great questions from the floor. They've all answered their questions. They've all been superb speakers. So can we all give them a big applause now? Before we go, I want to give a big applause for Eden Yardy sitting over here. The only person who made up the organizer. Um, and one real big thank you to Professor Mark Hennigan for your time and hosting us. So, um, thank you very much, Mark. And awesome. thank you everyone for coming, and I hope that you feel more informed after today. Thank you.